music. It, maybe it's not going to be too. Do you think the music is going to be too much of a problem? That ice machine might. The ice machine's worse than. Oh, okay. really? The ice machine cometh. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're starting? Yeah. All right. Larry, it's always good to see you and good to have you back in Dallas. Thank you. It's good to see you, Bobby. How are you? I am super good. And You never change. Well, you know, the years roll on. <laughs> well, not for some people. A lot of people are dead, so let's be happy that we're here and alive and well this morning. Huh? You bet. And you're feeling well, obviously. I feel great. I really do. I'm, uh, I'm very blessed. I, I rarely use the T word, tired. People say, well, aren't you tired? I said, no, I'm sleepy. <laughs> Get out of my room, I'm going to bed. <laughs> Y'all can have this party somewhere else, I'm going to bed. But I, I have g really good health. I, uh, I sleep five or six hours a night, and I get up and swim and play golf and do the show and play with my granddaughter and do the things I'm supposed to do, and I, I just feel very, very blessed. Well, it's obvious when we see you in the Will Rogers Follies that uh, you have boundless energy. <laughs> Well, you, you better look like you have boundless energy. When you're out there with 16 long-legged dancing girls, you better fake it if you're not. Uh, <laughs> that, that show enthuses me and, and uh, empowers me. And empowers is probably the wrong word, but it, it infuses me with, with energy because I love the man. I love what he stood for. I love our show. Um, and I know that every night. See, there was a guy playing football for Minnesota, and they got beat real bad. And they interviewed him on the sidelines, and he said, well, I'll tell you one thing. This game of football is still just about blocking and tackling. It ain't rocket surgery. <laughs> Bobby, we're not doing <laughs> rocket surgery up there. It's musical theater, and it's not supposed to be real heavy. This is not a real heavy, this is not the Iceman Cometh or Long Day's Journey in the Night. This is a musical comedy. And, uh, but it also has some very poignant moments and some things to say. So to be able to get up there and do that and have fun with those kids and to know that every night the audience, the folks who paid to get in, are going to like it. Because I have a history of that uh, 10 years ago in New York on the road. So uh, I know in advance that we're doing something that's entertaining and that people will, uh, will enjoy. So, and I get paid. What, what, how much more could I want? You are so comfortable in the role. And I know you did it on Broadway, and you've done it on tour. Were you always that comfortable with the role? Since the first night my feet hit the floor in New York, February 16th of 1993, it, it felt like, you know, an old pair of boots. Uh, it really did. There was a, another level that happened after I did it for eight months in New York and then did it on the road. We, uh, we took the road show to Tulsa. And we had a wonderful day with Joe Carter, who's the, uh, the director of the Will Rogers Museum in Claremore, Oklahoma, and his wife, Michelle. <coughs> After going through that museum and, and actually playing Will's guitar and touching his ropes, you know, doing rope tricks with his ropes and, and seeing movies and things, uh, another level of something doo -doo 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 happened uh, that evening on stage. I felt like it was not really me doing it, that it was Will doing it. So I got another comfort level with that. But, but from day one, I have loved it. Uh, it's not much of a stretch for me to do it. Uh, all my kinfolk, I'm married to an Oklahoma woman. My, my grandmother, a little half-breed Cherokee woman who lived, <coughs> was, excuse me, was born on the reservation in southeastern Oklahoma. So uh, I have an affinity for the role, and uh, I just love doing it. Do you think there's anyone today comparable to Will Rogers? That's, that's very difficult. Uh, probably, probably not that exact same thing. I mean, our modern day comedians, a Leno or a Letterman or something, I mean, those might be close. But our society has changed to the extent uh, that his, you know, small town, fifth grade, humility was something that we're not, we, we don't seem to honor humility uh, in a man like we used to. We honor uh, belly buttons <laughs> and <laughs> flash and spazazz and far be it for me to criticize belly buttons. They sure are pretty, aren't they? <laughs> but uh, 
it doesn't seem that our society, that if a man is just a humble, simple man, that's, that's not what we honor anymore. So uh, we have a lot of funny guys out there, you know, and, and I love to watch Leno and Letterman, and you know, I've been on their shows and done different things, or Dennis Miller or whatever. I think life has taken on a little bit different. Uh, wouldn't it be nice, you know, people say, wouldn't it be nice if we lived in a little bit simpler times? I would like to be able to live in simpler times and still have uh, the nitrous oxide when the dentist does, you know, fills a tooth. So you can't have it both ways. You want to go back to the old days? That means we have uh, surgery without anesthesia, so let's not do that. So I don't really long for the good old days, but but it would be, would be nice if we had uh, uh, someone who could kind of take that mantle and, uh, and uh, you know, just be a simple, humble, straight-talking human being. Well, we have you, and that's the next best thing. Well, you're sweet. I, maybe that's what this is for. You know, maybe that's what this is for. So while I said a while ago it's not exactly rocket surgery, it still has a place. And uh, I'm honored to do it. I, love, I can't wait till 8 o'clock tonight. Let's talk about the entrance on the horse. <laughs> Chester. <laughs> Chester steals the show. <laughs> Does that work out okay? Yeah, that's fine. We didn't know exactly. You know, in New York, we came down on this big rope, you know, I mean, from the fourth floor. I'd take an elevator every night to the fourth floor, crawl out on this little rail, hang on for dear life, and they dropped this rail. And that was a great entrance. But uh, <clears throat> we can't do that on the road. Uh, you have to figure out a different way to do it because there are some houses that you play that just won't accommodate that kind of deal. So we talked about how to do it because it has to be some kind of really grand entrance or the line doesn't work, the opening line. That was some entrance, wasn't it? If I just walk out there, that then the line doesn't work. So we found this wonderful horse up in Kansas City and Chester had been traveling around with us and Pam, the lady who owns the horse, very nice lady and the horse is very gentle. He he's just walks around, you just kind of pat him, he's fine. <laughs> Has his own dressing stall. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You do these monologues throughout the, the, the Will Rogers Follies, and, um, and they, they're really fun, and they seem so spontaneous. Are you sometimes ad-libbing in those monologues? Well, from the days in New York 10 years ago, uh, originally I think they wrote everything. Peter Stone wrote everything for Keith, I think. And then they realized that there would be things happening on the front page of the New York Times every day that, that Will would have commented about. So they gave Keith a little more leeway and they gave Mac Davis, who also played the role, a little leeway. And they gave me a little leeway. And the only criteria that I use is, would Will have said this? And uh, it's not whether Larry Gatlin thinks it's appropriate or not, that's not important. It's whether Will would have thought it was appropriate and okay to do. <clears throat> but like I say, they have given me some latitude so uh, his whole deal was, you know, we know his famous saying, I never met a man I didn't like. That's only the last half. The real saying is, I joked about every major politician of my day, but I never met a man. So you do both sides of the aisle. You're very bipartisan. You know, I picked on uh, President Clinton when he was in office when I was doing it in New York, and I think it's only fair to pick on my friend George W. Bush, the President of the United States. So that's what Will would have done. It's not about what Larry would have done, it's what Will would have done. Which makes you more nervous? The rope twirling or having to undress on stage and make <laughs> a costume change? <laughs> well, I told somebody last night, they asked me if I get nervous. I haven't really been nervous since the fourth grade and that was a spelling test. <laughs> uh, I don't get nervous. Nervous means you're afraid you're gonna screw up. I, I know I'm not gonna screw up. Now the rope trick, I was having a little problem with it. So that little part of it, let's let's use the word not nervous, let's use apprehensive. <laughs> uh, for some reason, I got into a deal that I just couldn't do the trick. But on the week off, I went home to Austin, took my ropes with me, worked on it for about two hours until I popped this unbelievable kink in my back for some reason. I was jumping in my kitchen trying to do this rope. The neighbors probably thought if they could have seen in the you know, what, this man has lost his mind. But, and some people think I have anyway. But um, I worked on it, figured it out, 
had to put the ropes down for three or four days while I got this kink out of my back. But last night I did it perfectly, the Texas skip. But because of the nature of the show, again, if I miss it, I can kind of clown around about it later and work on it at intermission, do it better the second act. So, uh, it, again, it's not about rope tricks, but that's just, you know, another little layer to the show. But no, I, but now getting undressed on stage, um, since I have on those boxer shorts and the flies sewn together, uh, there's no chance <laughs> of there being an embarrassing moment, you know. <laughs> In fact, this is more embarrassing right now, Bobby. Good <laughs> Lord. What's with, with Only the you would I let ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What, what, what's with the chewing gum? Did Will Rogers do oh, yeah. that? Yeah, that was a big... I mean, he did it in his movies. He did it in his uh, monologues in everyday life. He'd, you know, so it's... And I tell you, when I went to New York... I was having trouble with some of the phrasing. It wasn't, it didn't feel right. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me one day, the reason it doesn't feel like those little pauses is because you need to say a little something and then give it a, because that's what he did. And all of a sudden I realized, I went back and looked at some, some old movies and some films and some, that's what it was. It was, he'd say a little something and then he'd chew on it, <laughs> literally and figuratively <laughs> on what he said. So. We lose the gum for the uh, for the second act because it's a little more serious, but the first act, you know, kind of sets up what we're doing, and uh, there's a little bit because actually, there is a um, an old film of him doing rope tricks for his children, for for the four kids, and he had a little uh, a little uh, fence post thing beside him, and in New York we used a fence post. But he missed the trick, and so he looked at his kids, he said, I gotta get serious, or something like that. And he takes the gum out and puts it on the fence post, right? Does the trick, takes the gum <laughs> out. So we played all that in, <laughs> you know. Very effective. <laughs> I think one of the really fun numbers to watch from out front is the favorite sun number, where mm -hmm. you're doing what I call the hand and arm dancing. That's right. Now, how difficult was that to learn? Well, I had the, uh, the good fortune to watch it on uh, the video. They made a video for, of the first original cast of Keith Carradine and that New York Broadway cast that they sold and it was a big deal in Europe and a Japanese company helped them come in and do all that. And so I got to watch it a little bit. It's, uh, it takes a little time. But it, it came back to me, and uh, if you'll just forget it, don't try to think about what comes next. You know, um, every morning when I get up and, and when I shave, I don't think about shaving. You just put it on and you start over here. I always start. Now, if I tried to think about it and say, well, I'm going to start on this side tonight, I'd probably cut my throat. Just let those natural, it's kind of playing golf, let the natural thing that's going to happen. So. Just get up there and get in where the music can go, and it's uh, opening night. I got in the middle of it and got to thinking about what I was doing, and I looked like a windmill or something. Everybody else was doing it right, and I was doing it wrong. But last night, <laughs> I was in tune with the spirit of the universe, and I did it perfectly. <laughs> I think, mm -hmm. uh, though, that that Will Rogers, if he had to do that, would probably, you know, uh, do the same thing. He'd be out of step. Probably so. The, the, the key is to, th that he did was to s seem to be out of step, but know exactly where you are at all times, you know. And, and being able, I think what Will did, he was able to laugh at himself and not take himself too seriously. You know, one of his other famous sayings is he said, he said, we're all ignorant just on different subjects. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Let's talk about this artist composer in residence and you're working on a musical about Quanta Parker. And what is the status of that? Well, for years, I've wanted to, I, I thought it was a fabulous story. My dear friend, Red Stegall, who lives over in Weatherford, uh, our uh, poet laureate uh, here in the great state of Texas, wonderful songwriter and poet, storyteller. I, I had heard a little bit about that story uh, of Cynthia Ann Parker and their family and her being captured and re 
rescued or whatever. And uh, Red was telling me about this story years ago, and I've had it in the back of my mind. And uh, we were on a little trip up in uh, Will Barker County. My brother-in-law was raised up there on the Wagner Ranch, and we were going up there to his son's uh, bachelor party, or not bachelor party, for the reception. And, and I said, Red, tell me about that Cynthia Ann Parker story again. And he started telling me, and he put a, a, a song by a man named Andy Wilkinson had written a song about it, just one song called White Woman's Clothes. And it just reinvigorated me uh, about this wonderful story. You know, I'm doing a revival right now of Will Rogers, and I love it. And they did a revival of Oklahoma and of Sound of Music. And revi that's fine. That's great. It's a lot of fun, and they need to be done. Let me tell you what else needs to be done. We need to have somebody, an American, to write, or, or someone. I mean, I'm a, an American chauvinist pig. I bleed red, white, and blue. I think we need to tell American stories. God bless Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber and all of his stuff. That's terrific. But we need somebody to write songs about our country. There are things that have happened in this country, in this state. You know, I have the rights from my friend Billy Saul Estes. He's a car dealer over in Haltom City or Richardson or Garland or somewhere, I don't know. Uh, my wife's cousin is married to his daughter, Pam. He's given me the rights to write a musical about his life. It's an incredible life. You know, the guys in Enron did a heck of a lot more bad things than Billy Saul Estes ever did. All he ever did was give, figure out a way to give people a bunch of job out in the desert outside of Odessa. So um, there are stories to be written. So I shared that with Michael Jenkins, wonderful man who runs the Dallas Summer Musicals. And our, our lives and our dreams kind of touched. You know, he wanted somebody to do some original work. I wanted to do that. He has bricks and mortar. He has a place. He has a production company. So uh, he said, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be your composer in residence. I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds good. So he gave me a card that has composer in residence on it, Larry Gatlin. And, and Bobby, I'd like for you to have one of them. I'd love to. Uh, I'm the composer in residence. Visa and Master's. Yeah, I'll take that too. <laughs> no, you will not. You could have Dallas Summer Musicals, Composer in Residence. All right. That's me. We don't know what all it means yet, <laughs> but I believe it means that this wonderful man, Michael Jenkins, who's done so many productions, uh, that people in this, uh, the Dallas Metroplex, know and believe and trust that he's going to bring great shows uh, to the Music Hall at Fair Park, as has been the tradition. With, was it Mr. Meeks? Mr. Charlie Meeker. Mr. Meeker, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the folks for a, a tradition of 60 years. So uh, next August, a year from now, on that stage, we're going to premiere Quana, the Parker family saga, or whatever we're going to call it. And uh, uh, speaking of Andrew Lloyd Webber, I have a wonderful friend, Stephen Rain, who is a Brit, who's going to help me. I worked with him in the production of Civil War, you know, when I saw you last. And he helped, he directed that and brought it back from the dead. It was a total mess in New York on Broadway. But we redid it, he redirected it, and I knew 30 minutes into those rehearsals two years ago that I wanted to work with this man. He has an incredible eye, an incredible touch, and what he brings to it is a totally unbiased eye. You know, being a, a, a Brit, he doesn't know about any of this. So he came in totally objectively and we're starting from scratch. Uh, I've heard that, uh, that Larry Hagman is thinking about doing a movie based on Quanta Parker and I bless that. That's great. Uh, I hope it does well. I hope it's fabulous and wins Oscars and all that stuff. That's his project. I've had this one in my heart for 10 years and uh, I can't be sidetracked or, or detoured by other people's work. Uh, for years, I thought that if the Oak Ridge Boys had a hit record, that means that I wouldn't. I don't believe that anymore. My friends, the Oak Ridge Boys, I hope they have a hundred hit records. And what other people do has nothing to do with me. I root for them, cheer for them, but I'm going to do what's in my heart to do. And Michael has given me that opportunity to do that. Well, that will be something really wonderful to look forward to next year. And uh, as much as seeing a new show and your show, we'll get to do another interview. I know my part. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Larry, you're such a darling. Thank you so much Thank for your you. time. You're one of my favorites. I love you and appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and just stay on the list. I need some water, please, Joanne, if we could. Uh, wait just a second. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> Let uh, let's see how we're doing here. Okay. Um, you think we can? Yeah. Okay. Larry, from the get-go, from the New York production to now, were you always comfortable with the role of Will Rogers? I was, from from the first minute. Um, okay, that's it's good. It's no stretch. That's good. That's good. Okay. Which makes you more nervous? Undressing on stage, the costume change, or twirling the ropes? Actually, worrying about whether the horse is going to poop on stage <laughs> is my biggest worry, Bobby. Um, or whether I'm going to poop on stage. That wouldn't be. Very good. Okay. <laughs> All right. You're blushing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> The entrance on horseback, how about that? Well, you know, Chester steals the show every night. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> what's with the chewing gum? Did Will Rogers do that? Yeah, it was part of his deal, you know, he... Okay, very good. The monologue. We need to see, for future reference, yeah. if they can turn that down in here or something, please. Yes. <clears throat> the monologues, Larry, seem so spontaneous. Are you ad-libbing sometimes? <laughs> uh, all right. Um, the favorite song. Okay. <laughs> that thing just doesn't give up, does it? The favorite sun number, what I call the dancing hands and arms. How difficult was that to learn? Well, you know, it took a while to. <laughs> okay. All right. Your Quanta Parker, your musical that you're writing about Quanta Parker, mm -hmm. what's the status of that? How am I doing? You're doing great. <laughs> I feel like Marcel Marceau. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. I think that that will uh, cover us. Yes. And one of the things when I do the story that I'm going to put in there is Clive Barnes' quote.